started in about 60 seconds. Uh, we're just gonna wait for everyone to file on in from the waiting room. So we'll get started in about 60 seconds. Uh, while we wait, uh, for those who are comfortable doing so, uh, certainly no obligation, but for those who are comfortable doing so, uh, let us know in the chat uh, who your favorite New England Patriots player is. So uh, let us know in the chat uh, who uh, is your favorite New England Patriots player all time, all time greats we're talking about. And uh, we'll get started in about uh, 30 seconds or so. I just want to be respectful of those that are still in the waiting room. All right, we have a Gronk, we have a Tom Brady, a Vince Wilfork, there's a great one. Uh, Tom Brady, of course, Jim Plunkett, Jim Nance, Tom Brady, Edelman, excellent. Teddy Bruschi, Brady, keep them coming. We'll start in about 15 seconds. Uh, another Bruschi, John Hanna, another Bruschi, excellent. All right. Great. Well, we'll get started. Um, my name is Robert Hayes. I'm the uh, Community Outreach Librarian and Head of Technical Services at the Tewksbury Public Library. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, just to note that we're in webinar mode, so we cannot see you or hear you. Uh, if you have a question, you're going to type it into the Q&A box. If you have a comment, you're going to type it into the chat box. And we'll try to address as many questions and comments uh, as we can at the end of the presentation. Uh, I believe we're going to get roughly a 45 minute tour around the hall. Uh, then we're going to watch a five to 10 minute video. Uh, and then we'll take your, your questions in a QA. and a uh, Before we get started, uh, I want to thank the Friends of the Tewksbury Library for sponsoring tonight's event and for sponsoring all the events, uh, both in person and virtual at the Tewksbury Public Library. And I want to thank um, 11 other libraries who partnered with Tewksbury tonight uh, to help uh, promote and uh, get, a, uh, get a good crowd. Uh, Atkinson, New Hampshire, uh, Bill Ricca, Clinton, Drakett, Georgetown, Lowell, Manchester by the Sea, North Reading, Norwood, Raleigh, and Tingsboro. So we thank those libraries for helping us out tonight. All right, so uh, as a note, we are recording. We're also streaming live to Facebook. Uh, everyone who registered will get an email from me tomorrow with a link to the recording and also a link to a feedback survey. Uh, please take 30 seconds and fill that out. Uh, all right, so let's get to the good stuff. I'm gonna introduce Moira here. Um, let's see here. So we're joined by um, Mariah Ilsley education and group coordinator for the Patriots Hall of Fame for a live virtual behind the scenes tour. So Mariah has been working at the Patriots Hall of Fame presented by Raytheon Technologies since February of 2018. After beginning as an education assistant, Mariah assumed the education coordinator role in March of 2020. Uh, before joining the Hall education team, she had spent six years in interpretation and, and museum education, developing and delivering in-person and digital programs for the National Park Service in Lowell and in Quincy. Additionally, she worked at the Old Colony History Museum in Taunton, where she developed Passport to History and the field trip program Let's Map. Uh, Mariah received her MA in public history at the U University of Boston in 2017. So folks, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Mariah for joining us here tonight and giving us this wonderful tour. And Mariah, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you. Well, hi, everybody. I'm very excited that you all are here to join me today on a momentous day for not only uh, the Patriots, but for football and for football history. Um, we're going to have a whole lot of fun while we are here together. Now, before we dive in and I start showing you around, I did want to tell you just a little bit about our museum and about our Hall of Fame. Uh, the Hall of Fame was originally constructed, the museum, I should say, was originally constructed and opened in 2008. But the Patriots actually start their Hall of Fame back in 1991 because John Hanna, who I know was somebody's favorite, was the very first Patriots player to ever be inducted into the Professional Football Hall of Fame. When that happens, we think it's not only incredibly cool, but of course that we should be honoring um, a whole bunch of other players that have been amazing during our time here um, playing in New England. And so the Kraft family will open our museum in 2008 to celebrate all, not only of all of our Hall of Famers, but all of Patriots history. 
Now the museum is located directly in front of the stadium. There's a plaza in Patriot Place right in front of the stadium and we're located above the pro shop. So on the bottom floor of our building that we're in right now is the Patriots Pro Shop. And then we're on the second and third floors above that. Where I am right now is in what we call the Grand Hall, which is on the third floor of our museum. If you look behind me, you can see there's a big helmet there. And when you first arrive, you get to run through that helmet while Crazy Train plays, just like the Patriots do when they run out onto the field for a game day. But our museum not only covers Patriots history, but it touches on local uh, football history. There's lots of fun interactives. It's loud, it's exciting, and we're gonna get to explore all of that today. So I'm gonna flip my camera around so you can see everything that's going on around me. I would like to note though, that because of Tom Brady's news earlier today, there is a news crew here with me in the museum. So you're gonna to get to see them as well um, as we are going through. So let me flip that around so you can see everything. As I mentioned, I am in what we call the Grand Hall. And the Grand Hall is a pretty large space. So sometimes we'll put temporary exhibits here, but we will also have events here if we ever have. Sometimes the Kraft family will host formal dinners here. All of that sort of stuff will happen right here in this space. We do have a painting, which I think is really incredible, of Coach Belichick. And it's a little hard to see without somebody standing next to it, but I'm about five foot six ish. And this is probably about two feet taller than I am. So it is a larger than life representation of Coach Belichick. And the way his eyes are painted, they kind of follow you around the museum, um, or at least up here on the third floor, which is a lot of fun. Now, I want to show you first an exhibit that we call Building Blocks. And Building Blocks explores the history of the New England Patriots by it's by era, but that breaks down to pretty much by decade. We do have some Tom Brady jerseys in here as well today uh, because of his retirement news. This uh, case that we are looking at right now is all about the 1960s. So if we had anybody whose favorite players were from those early deck, that early decade of the New England Patriots history, a lot of that uh, you will see right here in this case. Now the Patriots, when they first are formed as a team are not known as the New England Patriots. They are the Boston Patriots. They were the eighth and final franchise in what was the American Football League. Eventually the American Football League joins with the National Football League and becomes the National Football League, the NFL that we know today. Uh, but at that point, like I said, the eighth and final team. And during that first decade, during the 1960s, the Boston Patriots do not have a home stadium. They are moving all around Massachusetts. They would play at Fenway, at Harvard. Uh, they were playing at Boston University, at Boston College. They'd either even go up and play in Haverhill sometimes. And it's exhausting. It's exhausting for the fans. It's exhausting for the players. And so one of the big efforts in the late 60s comes to fruition in 1971 when we receive or when we build I should say our very first stadium. It was known as Schaefer Stadium and if you look up here this newspaper um, it's a little bit faded now but it does say Schaefer Stadium home of the New England Patriots. Now, because we build our first stadium not in Boston, we will have a name change at this time as well. So they will become the New England Patriots instead of the Boston Patriots. During the 1970s, in addition to having Schaefer Stadium, we also start to lay the foundation uh, for the success that we are accustomed to as Patriots fans today. The 1980s is filled with highs and lows. We have some really incredible highs. We'll make it to our very first Super Bowl in the 1985 season. And I apologize, the light shining on this t-shirt makes it a little bit hard to see, but it's football players running towards a bear and it says, bury the bears. Super Bowl Patriots 1985. And that's because our coach at this time, his name was Raymond Berry, and we were playing the Bears, hence that play on words right there. So we do amazing things. We get it to our very first Super Bowl, but we also have some lows during this time. And one of the most severe was when our owner, James Orthwine, uh, wants to move the team out of New England to his hometown of St. Louis. 
So looking at these hats here, you'll see they have a purple and yellow color scheme and they say St. Louis Stallions. So the plan was to move the team out of New England, rename them the Stallions, have their new home be in St. Louis. But people were not happy about this. We liked having a team here in New England, regardless of how successful they were. And that includes the Kraft family. Now, Mr. Kraft at this time owned the stadium, the home stadium for the Patriots. And the way his lease was set up indicated that the Patriots were not allowed to play their home games outside of that stadium. So he was able to block their move to St. Louis. He would eventually purchase the team. And when he does so, it was the most any team had been purchased for at that time. I did also want to pause here for a, mo a moment to show you this plaster bust of John Hanna. It's actually the plaster version of his Professional Football Hall of Fame bust. The bronze one is, of course, in the Professional Football Hall of Fame, but I know we had some John Hanna fans in our group, so I just wanted to show that to you as well. Now, when Mr. Kraft buys the team, people were so excited and so grateful that he said that they were going to stay in New England, that they would line up during a snowstorm and buy all of the tickets for that entire season. During this time, we'll uh, switch away from the royal blue. We see that here with um, Bledsoe's jersey. That's when I first became a fan of the team. Switch away from the royal blue to the navy blue that we are accustomed to them wearing today. Now this case is called the championship era and it goes from 2000 to present. So we have lots of jerseys in here from Brewski, which is what we're looking at right now. We have Troy Brown, we have uh, Gronkowski, we have some Tom Brady stuff in here, um, really focusing on that kind of two decades of dominance. Oops, I apologize, my phone. Fell. So, there we go. Uh, really focusing on those two decades of dominance. Uh, we have uh, lots of artifacts in here from our, our perfect season where we won every game, but the Super Bowl, if we look down here, there's three footballs. The one in the back is actually the infamous butt fumble ball from that Thanksgiving game in 2012. We have Tom Brady's a uh, script from when he hosted Saturday Night Live. And up front here, we have four trophies. Three belong to Tom Brady. We have his most valuable player trophy from 2007, his offensive player of the year trophy from 2010, his most valuable player trophy from 2010, and the coach Belichick's coach of the year trophy from 2010. But most of the stuff that you would see in this case really goes, like I said, it goes to the present, but all of the really new stuff we keep in this case out here. So you can see we have a couple Tom Brady jerseys in here. We have a Jake Bailey jersey in here. Um, this particular one, we're gonna talk about a little bit more later on, but I did want you to see, this is Tom's jersey from Super Bowl 49 which was stolen and eventually returned. Like I said, we're gonna talk about that more a little bit later on. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on it now, but I did want you to see that we have it here in the museum. Uh, we have Matthew Judon's uh, classic red long sleeve undershirt. And this case will change pretty regularly. So when they did the My Cause My Cleats, uh, we would have those cleats in here. So this one changes pretty much all the time. This space over here is a changing exhibit. So this will rotate relatively regularly. Right now it's an exhibit called the All Dynasty Team. And the All Dynasty Team was voted by our fans. So it goes into detail a little bit more about their statistics, what Super Bowls they were in, what American Football Conference Championship games they were in, all of that sort of stuff. Now these jerseys are an example. There's one jersey from every different type that we have here in the Hall of Fame. So you can really see how the jerseys have changed over time. Modern jerseys are really short and tight. So they generally have an elastic waistband um, that keeps it nice and tight. But as we get older, they get longer. And then the really old ones from the 1960s 
have that tail. So it looks like kind of like a baby's onesie that would snap up front and then they would prevent the um, opposing team from pulling on it. Now, as we round this corner over here, we enter an exhibit called New England football. New England football focuses not on the Patriots, but on the development of the sport in New England. So all of the jerseys that we are looking at right now are different high schools who have won their respective Super Bowls. But some of the oldest artifacts in our collection are actually over here in this case. And one of the pieces that I find most interesting <laughs> is what they call a nose guard. They would use nose guards before helmets were developed. So looking at that, if you imagine those straps tie around your head, then the piece that we are looking at would hang down over your nose. And it was pretty good at preventing broken noses, but was not great at protecting the rest of your head, as I'm sure you can imagine. And so they do eventually move on to develop leather head helmets, and now the technology around helmets is pretty incredible. The NFL hosts um, kind of like helmet trials every year to make sure that everything is as safe as it possibly can be. The other thing I really wanted to highlight in this case for you is this ball here. This is the oldest known football. It's from a Harvard-Yale game, Har a Yale would win, and it dates from 1876. If you are looking at this thinking it does not look like what you are used to for footballs, that's because the forward pass wasn't invented yet. So football at this point in the 1870s is much more like soccer, and it's much more like rugby. It wouldn't be until a man named Walter Camp writes a book called American Football, where he really writes down the rules of football. He will invent the forward pass at that point. And that's when the ball starts to elongate a little bit. It's when you start to get those pointier ends to your footballs so that it's more aerodynamic, can fly through the air, and you can tuck it kind of under your arm and run with it a little bit. Speaking of American football, this is a copy of that book right here. Now, behind me, we have a motorcycle made for Adam Vinatieri to honor his three Super Bowl wins with the New England Patriots. So there's all sorts of details on this motorcycle to highlight that. Up along here, it says World Champions on the wheel. It has his three Lombardi trophies depicted. Back here, sorry, my shadow got in the way there. We have the rosters for the Patriots and for the opposing team for those first three Super Bowls. So some pretty cool stuff on this motorcycle here. Now this, I think is a lot of fun. And if anybody actually wants, this is what we call guess who. And if anybody actually wants to guess which players are here, feel free to put it in the chat. I'll make sure that I take a look at those. But let's start with this one. This guess who, you can see the player's baby picture right there. This player was born on July 24th, 1953 in San Antonio, Texas. If you have a guess, feel free to put it in the chat. <laughs> this player is Steve Grogan. So he was our quarterback from 1975 until 1990. Let's see, this one is another favorite of mine. I think this baby picture is very cute. But this player was born on May 1st, 1973 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you have any guesses, feel free to put it in the chat. I see a guest for McGinnis. I see a guest for Ty Law. Let's see. This one is actually Curtis Martin, who was a running back for the team from 1995 until 1997. Now, Curtis Martin is not in the uh, Patriots Football Hall of Fame, but he is in the Professional Football Hall of Fame. Uh, let's see. This one might be a little easy. 
This is not a player, but he is a key part of the Patriots organization. He was born on June 5th in 1941 in Brooklyn, Massachusetts. And yes, Adam, you already got it, my friend. This is Robert Kraft. <laughs> so I like these. I think they're a lot of fun. There's lots of different players that you can guess with. Now, as we come back this way, we do have one of the games that we developed with Raytheon Technologies, who's our naming sponsor for the Patriots Hall of Fame. And for this one, you can decide whether you want to pass or kick the ball. And let's see, let's pass today. And with that, we can change our X angle, our Y angle, our force and our delay to try and make a successful pass to the player who is on the right-hand side of the screen. It also tells us that the wind for this is at zero miles per hour. So if we, oops, sorry, I took too long. Now it's at four miles an hour. And if we make a couple adjustments here, hopefully we will have a successful pass. Oh, I was, I was a little late on that throw. My delay was too long. Uh, but that is one of the games here that um, our not only our, uh, our hall of excuse me not only our visitors, but our field trip groups that come have a lot of fun playing with those. That is one of the games that we have here. The other one that we have that we developed with Raytheon is called In the Numbers. And Pat Patriot hosts this one. And for that, you can play against other players, answer simple math questions to try to move your player down the field. I apologize. To score a touchdown. Now rounding the corner here, this is a temporary exhibit that we have up for Richard Seymour, who is our most recent inductee into the professional, excuse me, into the Patriots Football Hall of Fame. He was technically, um, chosen in 2020, but because of COVID, we were unable to induct him. And so he had his induction ceremony in October of 2021. Now we have explored the third floor. So we're gonna head on down to the second floor of our museum. I'm gonna head on down the stairs here. At the bottom, we are going to have a view of the stadium. The lights aren't on, so it's a little tricky to see, but what we are going to be looking at is the north end zone. Now you may have heard about the construction that's going to be happening at the north or, or in the north end zone. And they have, I apologize, my mobile device doesn't want to hold up my phone. So I apologize that that has happened. Um, but what we're going to be seeing down here at the bottom is Gillette Stadium and it is the north end zone. They have started construction on that. When they complete it, we'll have one of the largest um, video boards in the country. We will almost triple the height of that logo that may, or the lighthouse that makes the logo for Gillette Stadium. And you can kind of see some of the lights on in the stadium uh, through the window here. Now that we have made it down to the second floor, we are going to take a look at an, uh, at what we call Once a Patriot. And this explores not the on the field relationship between these players, but the off the field relationship. They strongly feel that you can't make it to the Hall of Fame unless you have that those teammates, unless you have that camaraderie. And so everything in here focuses on the off the field relationship between the players and their family and their friends. This banner um, is from the 1960s. It's from the 1963 Eastern uh, Division Championship game. And this actually hung in Fenway. But after one victory, after one victory, the fans rushed the field and this banner was stolen. Nobody knew what happened to it. It was gone completely gone, no rumors about what happened to it, nothing. And then when we opened our museum, somebody came and they said that they had this. Um, they didn't want to admit how they got it, but they wanted to give it back, back to the Kraft family. They accepted and now it proudly hangs here in the Hall of Fame. Now rounding the corner, we do enter the Patriots Hall of Fame. 
To be inducted into the Hall of Fame, you have to be retired from playing for four years. It does not matter if you play somewhere before you play with the Patriots or after you play with the Patriots. All they look at is your time playing for our team, but you have to be retired and then you're eligible. We have a selection committee that uh, looks at all of the eligible players, uses a point system to pick the top three potential inductees, and then we allow our fans to vote on who will actually be inducted into the Hall of Fame. We will generally have an induction ceremony either in the summer or in the fall. The inductee will be given a really nice custom made red jacket. They are given a trophy. Mr. Kraft will give them a watch and then we will put their name and number on our Hall of Fame wall over here. We will also put update our database to reflect that player. So looking here, when we work with these kiosks, I'm sorry, you know what I'm just gonna do? I apologize, give me one second, folks. I'm just going to take my phone out entirely. And that way, we'll be able to do this a little bit smoother. I appreciate your patience. I am terribly sorry that this has happened, um, but my, my phone holder just didn't wanna work today. <laughs> so with our kiosk here, what you would do is you would come up, you would, it's a, a touch screen so you can come up, interact with it as you want. You can scroll through, pick any Hall of Famer that interests you. I know we had a John Hanna fan, so we'll pick John Hanna today. It'll give you a biography about him. Um, it, you can look at his statistics. You can watch his highlight reel. And when you click on your Hall of Famer, it will change what is on that 30 foot pylon. So you can see pictures of your Hall of Famer. You can watch videos of your Hall of Famer. And then, as I mentioned, you can watch highlights of your Hall of Famer as well. The only position on the field that I really feel good at is offense line because most of the time, you're the aggressor. Now, people, when they come to visit us, love this part of the Hall of Fame. They spend a lot of time here interacting, exploring, and looking at their favorite Hall of Famers. Now, approaching our Hall of Famers wall. As I mentioned, each Hall of Famer when they are inducted has their name and number etched onto one of these glass plaques. It is hung here for everybody to see. There is also a contributors category. There are only three contributors, Billy Sullivan, who is the founder of the team, Gil Santos, who is the longtime radio broadcaster and sport, uh, voice of the New England Patriots, and then Tracy Cermonti, who is inducted in 2021 uh, as a cheerleading director. Now, Tracy had been with the team for a number of years. She actually started as a cheerleader, worked her way up to being cheerleading director, and she very sadly passed away of cancer in December of 2020. And so it is only rightful that she take her place here in the Patriots Hall of Fame. And this exhibit that we are looking at right now are some of her costumes from her time with us. Now, moving on into the next exhibit, we enter what's called in the moment. And the first thing that we see in the moment are a series of footballs. There is one football in here for every game in our longest winning streak. And that winning streak went from October 5th of 2003 to October 24th of 2004. Every ball is painted to show where the game was played, what number game, who, uh, what date it was, and the score of that game. And then underneath is the cover of Patriots Football Weekly uh, that, uh, for the week that game was played. Now, looking behind me, we have our American Football Conference Championship trophies. We have won the American Football Conference Championship, meaning we have played in the Super Bowl 11 times. We have been the best in the AFC. We have competed in the Super Bowl 11 times and six of our AFC Championship trophies are the old style that looks like this. So it has the wooden base there. They did change the design. And so we have five trophies that are the new design a little bit sleeker, and they did that to make it resemble the Super Bowl trophy a little bit more, that Lombardi trophy. Now, as we move down this way, we start to enter the really interactive part of our museum. 
You can see there is a tractor hanging above me here, which was used in 1982 to clear not only the field uh, marker lines, but also to clear a spot for the kicker John Smith. It was very controversial, the use of this uh, tractor, uh, which is why we have it here in our museum. But we, as we move past that, enter what we call the snow globe. And the snow globe, as I get closer, it'll trigger, so it'll start the video, but the snow globe tells us all about Adam Vinatieri's amazing kick in what we call the snow bowl game against the Raiders. Now, for me personally, it was this game that made me become a fan of the New England Patriots. delineations of the yard markers, you getting slipperier as the snow piles up here in Foxborough. And now, Patriots, the time out, and here comes Adam Vinatieri onto the field. 45-yard field goal attempt coming up. Snap, ball down. Get off on the way. It was a lot of snow. And it started about three or four hours before the game. I didn't feel like it was home field advantage. <laughs> I was cold. <laughs> it was one of those days that it was just, it was like it was made for TV. Again, it locked back to the road. So in addition to watching this really awesome video about the kick, you can actually try to make your very own field goal kick. People really enjoy doing this and I will try it, but please don't expect it to be a good kick. It is actually incredibly difficult to try to do. Adam Vinatieri himself said that there was only a one in 10 chance that he successfully made that kick that night. So I'll give it a whirl, but I promise I am nowhere near as good as Adam Vinatieri. Ah, nope, not today. <laughs> now, after you try your field goal kick, you start to move into an exhibit called Inside the Game. And for Inside the Game, you are actually exploring what it's like to be a New England Patriot. You can take a look at a reproduction of the locker room, which is just around the corner here. You can sit on the winter bench, which is actually a heated bench. So if you look at those long rectangles, the players will stick their feet in there. And the short wide rectangles, they'll put their hands in there to keep nice and warm during a game. You can stand in a huddle with some of our players. We have Tom right here. You can test your reaction time with Teddy Bruski. You can break down plays with Coach Belichick. You can test your weight with Vince Wilfork. You can test your vertical jump height with Devin McCourty. And once you have explored all this, you'll head down this hallway towards our Super Bowl exhibit. Now we are coming up in actually just two days to the anniversary of our very first Super Bowl win um, in the 2001 season. But early on in the 2001 season, the play, the, during one of the first games of that season, the Patriots weren't ready to run out onto the field when the announcer started to announce their starting lineup. And at that time, you either announced your uh, starting offensive lineup or your starting defensive lineup. Teams were introduced as a whole. Um, so they all just ran out together. They weren't ready yet. They started announcing them. So they all just ran out together. And it is something they kept up for that entire season, everybody running out together. So when it came time for the Super Bowl, the league official insisted that the Patriots must announce either their offensive or their defensive starters. But Bill Ch Belichick told the official that his players didn't want individual recognition and they would rather emerge as a team and they would do that regardless of who was announced. So the NFL finally agreed to the Patriots request. They were introduced as a team and now every team is introduced as a team. So as we move through here, you will hear the announcer. He will say choosing to be introduced as a team, the New England Patriots. Let's take a listen. And now, ladies and gentlemen, choosing to be introduced as a team, the New England Patriots. And as we emerge out, we do enter our Super Bowl exhibit. Now we have one 
kind of smaller space, what we call a pod for every Super Bowl win. So this is the Super Bowl pod for our very first Super Bowl win, Super Bowl 36. So we have some artifacts from that Super Bowl. And then you can explore that Super Bowl much more in depth through these touch screens. So you can learn all about the season, come with some of the key storylines of that season. You can look at highlights from the game. Good afternoon, everyone. From the Louisiana Superdome, it is Super Bowl 36. You can see who the MVP was, which was Tom Brady for that one. You can look at the roster. You can look at the scoring summary. You can watch each scoring play. The holder is Ricky Paul. The snap the ball is down. The kick is up. It is on the way. And it is booked. A 50-yard field. And then you can look at the game book for each Super Bowl as well, which literally tells you play by play what was happening in that game. In addition, in this area, we have a giant video scoreboard, which goes through some of those Super Bowl storylines. You can hit Adam, just take your time and know. Do what you do. Just be you. Which is another place that a lot of our visitors spend a lot of time. Now, rounding the corner here, we enter an exhibit called Anatomy of a Comeback. And this is actually one of my favorite exhibits in the museum. This one will detail for you, play by play, how the New England Patriots were able to come back and beat the Atlanta Falcons during um, that Super Bowl where we had the deficit. We only had three points, Atlanta had 28 points. We come back, we win that game in overtime. It is the only Super Bowl to be decided in overtime. And it was definitely one for the history books. So what we are looking at right now is the strip sack. And we actually have the ball that was sacked, that was dropped during that sack here. This one is that incredible Julian Edelman catch for which we have his helmet and his gloves. And then finally, we have White's touchdown for which we actually have his full uniform and the ball. In addition to all of these artifacts, we also have a video that goes through play by play detailing that win. What's going on? Number 12 is going to be in there, fired up, ready to compete. Third and 10 from the New England line. Tom takes the snap. There's pressure. He throws toward the right. Hogan makes the grab at the 25. Money throw. Number 12, Tom Brady. Which is a great spot to watch considering his retirement news today. Behind me over here, we have the helmet, the gloves, the cleats, and the ball from Malcolm Butler's interception catch. And then we have our Super Bowl trophies. Now, the New England Patriots have six Super Bowl uh, victories. Uh, they are tied with the Pittsburgh Steelers for the most of any um, NFL franchise. So we do have our six trophies right here. We have the screens behind that show highlights from those games. And then in front, we have the rings. Now, the rings are actually pretty interesting because they change pretty drastically with each win. So this is the win from our very first Super Bowl. It's only about an inch wide. But if we go down to our sixth Super Bowl win, I'll take a peek at all of them as we go down, you'll notice that they get significantly bigger with each win. And then finally, for Super Bowl 53, that ring is almost two inches tall. So it's almost twice as big as the win, as the ring from our first Super Bowl win. Now, after every Super Bowl win, there is a victory parade. So here we have the duck boat, or one of the duck boats that the Patriots used during their victory parades. This one is actually called Patriots. And as we go through here, you'll have a feel of what it's like for the players during those parades. 
You'll be able to hear the noise, see the crowd. The noise in this part, the crowd noise is actually triggered by how many people are in here. Because it's just me, it might be a little bit quiet today. But, but you can see that. And then the suit, the duck boat that we were just in is actually in the photograph on this wall. It's this one just right here, the second one in the back. We're all patriots. And tonight, the patriots are world champions. So as Mr. Kraft says, we are all patriots. Now that does conclude our tour of the Hall of Fame. So I'm going to start making my way back to our uh, workstation where we will have a brief artifact demonstration. This video will be about six minutes and I'm going to shut up. Okay, sorry about that. Carlos. I appreciate um, your patience during all of those changes there. And now we're turning back to our station where we uh, where I'm going to show you that artifact demonstration video. Now this video is about six minutes long, but it does show a really nice. I um, think they're an example of some of our favorite artifacts in our museum. Some of them we took out of the skin, some of them we pulled out of our um, archiving room. So we'll show you those. And then if you have any questions whatsoever, I would love to address those for you. So, Robert, it doesn't look like I am able to screen share. Is there a workaround for that? For one second. Uh, Mariah, you should be all set now. Awesome. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Mori, and I'm the executive director of the Patriots Hall of Fame presented by Raytheon Technologies. Happy to be with you today to show you some of the items from our collection. So the first item I have is a football that was used in a 33 to 8 win over the Oakland Raiders by the Patriots in Mexico City. And you can see the logo on the ball. It says Mexico on it. And um, this ball is special because it was used to set a franchise record. Former kicker Steven Gostowski kicked this ball 62 yards to convert a field goal, which is the longest made field goal in Patriots history. Now, a couple interesting points. One is the fact that the game was played in Mexico City, which is at a much higher elevation than Foxborough, Massachusetts. So with the higher elevation, you have thinner ear air and the ball will travel far. So while in Foxborough, you might not really try a 62 yard field goal in Mexico City, not only do you attempt it, but you can make it. So uh, this set of, this is the ball that set a franchise record. An uh, interesting fact about these footballs is right here, where my finger is, is a K. It's hard to see on here, but the, the kickers use a special ball that are put into the game just for kicking plays. So there's a different ball that is used on first down, second down, third down for running and passing plays. But on kicking plays and punting plays, they throw the K ball into the game. And the reason they do that is several years back, the kickers used to try to manipulate the footballs. So across the league, they were having a problem. Kickers would put the ball in the dryer. They would try to do anything they could to make the ball easier to kick. So in order to stop that practice, the NFL implemented special K balls that only are in the game for kicking and punting. Our next item uh, is a pair of cleats from uh, 2019. These were worn by Stefan Gilmore, who became the first Patriots player in NFL history to win NFL Defensive Player of the Year award. And these are kind of cool. You can see here the dirt is still caked into the bottom of the cleats and around the sides here in the front, there's a lot of dirt on these cleats. And that's the way we want them when we collect something from the field. We want it to have a level of authenticity to show you, wow, this was used, and clearly this was used on natural grass to have all the grass stuck into the bottom of them. So it does add a, a, add a cool factor to it. And then just to show you a, a separate pair of cleats here, these belong to Rob Gronkowski. And just to show you the difference in size between Stefan Gilmore 
and Gronk's foot. Gronk wears a size 16, and these were worn during his rookie season uh, in a game on November 14th, 2010, when he set a Patriots record, uh, becoming the first rookie to have three touchdowns in a game. So these were special cleats from Rob Gronkowski's rookie season, and obviously Gronk went on to have a great career with the Patriots. Our next item I want to show you is a jersey. Now, back in the 60s and the early 70s, the jerseys were very different than they are today, and I always think these are kind of funny to show you guys. This jersey belonged to Reggie Rucker, who actually played his college football at Boston University. Well, if you can see here, it's got a tail, but it's really not a tail. It's, it's what I would compare it to a onesie that a baby wears. So you're all familiar with a onesie that snaps underneath on a baby. Well, this does the same thing. So this wraps around underneath and buttons in the front and it made it hard or made it impossible for people to be able to grab the jersey and pull it untucked. So that's what they did back then is they would have that piece that buttons, comes underneath and buttons in the front. And just to compare that to Julian Edelman's jersey, you can see this is a jersey that Julian Edelman wore and it has an elastic bottom at the, at the waist level here. It's got an elastic band in there and there's no real sleeves to this jersey. His arms come out from the side of the jersey underneath the shoulder. And the reason they do that is because this piece right here where my hand is would then fit very tightly over the shoulder pad. And so they want the jersey really tight so a defensive player can't grab it and hold on to it and be able to tackle and buy his jersey. So that's why they wear it like that. A couple other jerseys to show you. Uh, this one was worn by Randy Moss and he wore this in the 2007 season finale against the New York Giants at the Meadowlands in New Jersey. And he wore this jersey when he set the single season NFL record for most touchdown catches in a season with 23. It was actually Tom Brady's 50th touchdown pass of the season, which also set a record back then. That Brady's record has since been broken, but Randy Moss is still the single season uh, touchdown reception leader in NFL history with 23, and he did it while wearing this jersey against the Giants in the 2007 regular season finale. This item here, this belonged to Tom Brady. So I took this off display. Tom Brady wore this jersey in Super Bowl 49. You heard me talk about the cleats and the dirt on the cleats. Well, you can see here the grass stains on the jersey, on Brady's jersey. Uh, he wore this in the Super Bowl 49 win over the Seattle Seahawks, a 28 to 24 win. The Patriots were actually down 10 points in the fourth quarter of that game, and Brady completed 13 of 15 passes and won the, the Super Bowl MVP award while wearing this jersey. Uh, at the time, that was the biggest fourth quarter comeback in Super Bowl history. A couple years later, in Super Bowl 51, the Patriots had an even bigger comeback when they came back from 28 to three with two minutes and 12 seconds left in the third quarter to beat the Atlanta Falcons in Super Bowl 51. So I hope you enjoyed that artifact demonstration. And if you have any questions, we can certainly answer those for you, but uh, have a great day and, and thanks for joining us today. about anything that we have seen or anything in the artifact demonstration, anything whatsoever, I would love to address those for you as best as I can. Um, I do see that there is uh, a question about the trophies. Are they on loan to the museum? So everything, um, all of the trophies that we have are actually our trophies. Uh, so for some of them, there are multiple copies of the trophies. Um, so for the Super Bowl trophies and for the um, AFC Championship trophies, Mr. Kraft also has a set of trophies uh, that he keeps in his office. Uh, but we have a set here as well. Which ones are the ones that are actually on the field? All of that sort of stuff, I do not know. Um, but I do know that the um, Super Bowl trophy that Gronk dented is the one that we do actually have. Um, so that's kind of a fun little tidbit there. <laughs> but, um, let's see. 
I let's see, does the NFL slash Patriots retire numbers like other major leagues do? So as far as I'm aware, the NFL does not retire numbers uh, because for a very long time, if you played a certain position, you had to wear a number within a certain range. They very recently changed that rule. Um, so generally, no, uh, but there will be numbers that uh, specific organizations kind of stay away from. So it won't be an official retiring, uh, but they'll stay away from that number. Uh, but I would be interested to see how that changes now that they don't have that rule in place and if they do start to retire numbers. Uh, let's see, any memorabilia from concerts, events that have been held at Gillette? So not in the Hall of Fame, because what we focus on are very is very specifically Patriots. Um, but we do in the kind of... Um, in the, in the stadium itself, sometimes there will be um, memorabilia from different types of events. At the very least, there is um, uh, photos from those events kind of spread out all over the place in there. Um, Mariah, before you move on to the next question, is there anything we can do about the background noise or is that kind of, is, is, is it, uh, it is what it is to, to, quote, a, to quote a great coach? Fortunately, it is what it is. That's just kind of the noise that we have here in the museum from our exhibits. No um, problem. So I have muted everything that I have on me yeah. right now. Um, You're fine. Fortunately, those other voices that we're hearing are from that Once a, uh, Once a Patriot exhibit where they yep. have oral histories from some of the older players. Um, so that's kind of what we're hearing um, right now. I apologize about that. No, no problem. No problem. Uh, we do, I just wanted to let you folks know if anybody is interested in visiting us in person, we are open seven days a week right now from 10 a.m. until 5 p.m. Uh, so you can come see us anytime and you can either buy tickets online or you can buy them at the door, whatever is uh, easier for you. We are happy to do that. Um, where is the ball from Edelman's catch in the Super Bowl against Atlanta? That is an excellent question. I know that we have our, what I showed you, we have that kind of on display. Frequently, we won't have some piece of that because Mr. Kraft will actually give it to the player who was involved in that. So I wouldn't be surprised if Edelman actually has that, um, that piece, which is pretty, I think, pretty cool. Um, one of the interesting things and one of both, it's really fun, but it's also a little bit of a challenge sometimes, is that the organization owns everything. So the jerseys that the players are wearing, the balls, the helmets, um, they own all of that. And so frequently, um, the player will want something, and if they want it, they'll have to work with the organization to get it, just like we do. So if we want a ball or a helmet or a jersey, we have to actually, our curator will work um, with the equipment manager to get a lot of that stuff. Um, we'll write, e he'll frequently be writing emails during games, you know, I want this, this amazing thing just happened, I want this for the museum, um, and so he's working with them for that, but sometimes they'll want to keep it, like with those Tom Brady jerseys that we saw both in the museum from Super Bowl 59, uh, uh, excuse me, 51 and 49, um, those were stolen, and so nobody knew where they were for a long time, we just assumed that Tom had them, um, and then when they were returned to us, Mr. Kraft gave us the one from Super Super Bowl 49, he gave Tom the one from Super Bowl 51. So sometimes the organization will make the decision to give the player um, some of the equipment. And um, uh, Mariah, uh, Ashley asked, um, does the NFL or the Patriots uh, retire numbers like other major leagues do? So they don't currently um, because for a long time, they uh, specific positions had to wear a certain number range. And so they didn't want to limit the numbers available to them. So they didn't retire numbers for a long time, but they pretty recently took that rule away. So I'll be interested to see what happens. There was kind of an unofficial retiring that you would see sometimes in organizations where if they had a really incredible player, um, the players that followed him would kind of stay away from that number. Um, so, but I'll be interested to see what happens now that that rule has changed. Uh, Bob asks, do many people use the interactive display uh, of the Patriots all-time roster? They do. They do. So there's lots of really fun interactives. And really, it's kind of whatever you're into. There's really something for everybody here in our museum. Uh, but the interactive display for the all-time roster is definitely something, it's relatively new for us. So it's something that people are really kind of getting into the groove to. Our returning visitors don't 
uh, like I said, it's new. So they didn't, uh, a lot of them didn't know it was there. So our amazing guest services staff has been really incredible about uh, directing people to it and showing them how to use it and all the different uh, types of information that you can pull up on there. Uh, but it is definitely becoming one of our more popular uh, displays here in the museum. Uh, after today's news, will Coach Belichick be donating his cell phone to the museum? <laughs> That's a I I kid, I kid. So uh, Mariah, I don't see any other questions. Um, so let's give Mariah a big virtual round of applause for a phenomenal job this past hour. I have no idea how you did it all, Mariah, with your multiple devices. And uh, that was very impressive uh, technology wise. I learned quite a bit. Uh, do you have any last words for the group uh, before we wrap up? Uh, no, but thank you all so much for your patience. Um, as you said, I did have multiple devices going, and so uh, we had a little bit of technical difficulty there, so I appreciate your patience during that um, and your flexibility and for staying with me. So thank you all so much. I really hope to see you here sometime in person. Excellent. Thank you all so much. I want to thank Atkinson, Dorica, Clinton, Drake, Georgetown, Lowell, Manchester, North Reading, Norwood, Raleigh, and Tingsboro, also the Friends of the Library here in Tewksbury. Uh, look for an email for me tomorrow with a link to this recording and also a link to a quick feedback survey. So thank you all so much, and I hope you have a great night. Go Pats!